carry on eating. I know it's difficult to eat and listen at the same time, but on the other evenings you've done quite well. And this is the last of this series of talks on the good news that John wrote. Many of you will remember that John was a close friend of Jesus, and he wrote this book particularly to help those who read it to learn to trust Jesus and to discover the wonderful things that Jesus could do in their lives if only they responded to him. So he brings together lots of stories that give us a really good introduction to who Jesus was. Uh, somebody said to me earlier that they had actually read through all this book this morning and found it really good and really amazing to get this, this picture in words of who Jesus is and what he can do. And that's what we've been looking at this week as we've looked at different issues in the light of what Jesus taught and what Jesus claimed. And this evening, our subject is the amazing claims that Jesus made about peace. And when you look at this uh, picture here, you see different sorts of people who in one way or another need peace. Some of them because they feel very sad in their hearts. Some of them because they feel very angry inside. Some of them because they are deeply puzzled and some of them just feel they've missed the way in life, that they feel that they are lost. And as we have done our studies together, we have thought of the fact that women and men are made by the God who is the one true God, and that we are made to know him and do things with him, and when we are separated from him, we have all sorts of problems and, in fact, often live in ways that build even stronger barriers between us and the God who made us. Many of you remember I quoted this um, man from Zhengzhou in Henan province uh, who said to me, I've made a mess of my life. I need to get back in harmony with the one who made me. And in a sense, he is speaking about tonight's topic as well, that people need peace. Now, there are different ways that people try to get peace other than the Christian faith. And you will have probably noticed how people in Durham try to deal with the sort of heartaches that they have. Some people just try to hide the problem like people who, instead of really cleaning the room, sweep all the dirt under the carpet and pretend it's clean and okay when actually it isn't. And some of us do that sort of thing with our lives as well. There are things that trouble us, but we sweep them away. We don't deal with them. We just hide them for the time being. Then there's a different sort of person, and some of them will be out tonight on the streets, and they deal with their heartache by having a fun time, holding a party. I think those girls are in St. Mary's. I can't remember which college I got them from, but I found a picture of Durham students having a wild party, and I chose one of the uh, more restrained photographs. <laughs> of people having a fun time. But the trouble with having a fun time, and I love having fun times, is that if you haven't really dealt with the problems in your heart, uh, the next morning you're back to the same problem. The third way that people try to solve the problem is what I'm calling here meditation. Get out into the country in a quiet place and just be quiet. And many people who do that think that they can find the answer deep down inside their own personalities. Now, if you talk to my wife, you will, she will tell you that 
I am almost never quiet, even when I'm asleep. So I'm not really a good person to speak about meditation, but what I want to say is this. It is sometimes good to be quiet, and it is sometimes good to get away to a quiet place. I like getting away to the mountains. But if God has made us, and we are not at peace until we belong to him, we're not going to really find the answer inside ourselves. And the Christian faith says the answer is not to be found in you, it is to be found in Jesus. And Jesus offers a different kind of peace. Now last night somebody complained that I got you to look to too many parts of this in too short a time. So tonight I'm going to try and make it less but I'm actually going to tell you a number of things that Jesus said in a long talk with his friends when he knew that the next day he was going to be executed. He was going to be nailed on a cross. So he talked to his friends to prepare them for some of the problems of life. And it's important to understand that when Jesus offers us peace, he doesn't say, and if you trust me, you will never have any problems. But he does promise that he will be with us in those problems, and he will have brought us into harmony with God, and that makes a huge difference in all the pressures of life. So if you were for example, to look on page 43, Jesus says there, at the bottom of page 43, at figure 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. And then later the same evening, if you turn on to page 48, he says to them right at the end of this very long talk, I have told you these things so that in me you have, may have peace. He's saying, I've talked to you so that you will know that if you belong to me and your life is shared with me, you will have peace. And then he says something different. He says, in the world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Do you see what he is saying here? He is saying that peace will be given to us because we've got some answers that Jesus gives. Peace will be given to us if we receive and welcome Jesus as our Savior. Peace will be given to us, but that doesn't mean we'll not have problems. And I have to say to you, somebody said to me uh, earlier this week uh, that they were afraid of the problems of being a Christian in their country because there were laws that made it difficult. And for some of you, there will be problems if you really follow Jesus in your country. I have had people in a number of countries who have cried on my shoulder because they have had trouble just because they love Jesus. But do you see what Jesus says here? He says, be of good courage because I have overcome the world. In other words, what he is saying is the future is with Jesus, your future forever. Do you remember last night, some of you, we were talking about what happens when we die? If you know Jesus, your future forever is with him. 
Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about the way to peace, because as we go on through this book, we find that the next thing that happens to Jesus is that he is crucified and dies on a cross. And many people would say, well, that's crazy. He said he's going to help me in all my problems, and then he goes and dies. That's crazy. That means he's useless. And if you look on the middle of page 55, it says at figure 30, when Jesus had received the drink, he said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus was put to death. Now, there are different ways that people in the world look at this. Some of my Jewish friends say that proves that Jesus was not somebody who, gave, who pleased God. God obviously said he rejected Jesus or Jesus wouldn't have died such a terrible death. Some other of my friends, one uh, uh, Islamic friend of mine, said when I told him that Jesus died, he said, he didn't die. God would never allow such a holy person to die like that. But the Bible teaches us, and Jesus taught us, that he had to die, as it were, to buy peace for us. Sometimes for human beings, when God draws near, they feel very uncomfortable. Once I prayed with a scholar from China here in Durham, and before I had finished praying, he nudged me and said, Dick, there's something very important you need to know. I said, what is it? He said, I am a very dirty sinner. In other words, he was saying, I feel very uncomfortable with this God. I'm not good enough. And I was surprised because up until that point, our discussion had been very intellectual. But at that point, when I prayed and he sensed that the God who made him was near to him, suddenly he felt very uncomfortable. And I thought, I am glad he feels uncomfortable because now he can understand that Jesus had to die to take away all that dirty stuff in his heart that was making him uncomfortable and not feeling in harmony with God. Do you see what I'm trying to say? It's very important to see this because the Bible does teach us that Jesus is the only way. But then the question comes, somebody once said to me, I'm very bad, do you think that would be enough to make it okay for me to come to know God? How do we know that when Jesus died, he was successful in what he wanted to do, in paying for our sins? And the answer is to be found uh, on page 56 and 57, where it tells us the amazing story of what happened after Jesus died. And in this part of the book, there are three stories. There is a story of a woman called Mary, who discovered that Jesus was alive, then there is a story of a group of men whom she told that Jesus was alive and they didn't believe her. And then there is a story of a man who wanted lots of evidence because before he would believe. Let me first of all read you the story about the woman. It's in the middle of page 24. Uh, 56, sorry, middle of page 56, it says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene, that's her name, went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. This is Jesus' grave. 
So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. After that, two of the guys go and investigate the tomb and they see enough evidence in the tomb to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. But Mary didn't. So look on page 57 at figure 10. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary? She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, the language they spoke, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, don't hold on to me for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm referring to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Now, think about that for a moment. Here's Mary. She had learned so much about Jesus and she thought he was going to solve all the problems of her life. And then he died. Can you imagine how disappointed she was? And she went to the tomb, the place where she could at least offer respect. And she saw that the grave was open and the body wasn't there. She didn't look at the cloth that had wrapped the body or she would have seen that it had just fallen down as the body had risen. But she assumes the worst. Her hope has gone. What is she going to live for now? And then Jesus comes to her, but she doesn't recognize him. You say, but he was her friend. Of course he would, she would recognize him. Oh, no. Do you know, years ago, before I got married to Rose, we were friends together and colleagues. And one day we went to a Bible teaching week and she went that way in one car and I went another way in another car. And the next day I was preaching, teaching the Bible in a church. And as I came into the church at the start of the meeting, I saw a woman and I thought, that really looks so like Rose. But I knew Rose had gone that way and I had gone that way. So I ignored her because I hadn't been introduced. And then halfway through my teaching, I looked again and I thought, it is Rose. But you see, if you don't expect to see someone, you assume it's someone else. And of course, Mary didn't expect to see Jesus again because he had died, and there he was. And do you see what Jesus did? He says, Mary, that's all. Isn't that nice? I find that very interesting, because even today I find sometimes I'm in a group like this, and some people say, oh, that's very interesting, I'll think about it some more. And somebody else says, ah, I knew Jesus was here tonight, and it was as though he was knocking at me, wanting to come in. It's funny, isn't it? I remember speaking at Oxford University once, and the ca captain of the athletics club said, while you were talking, 
I had a feeling that Jesus wanted me. He said, I looked over my shoulder and expected to see him. Now, of course, we can't see Jesus today, but sometimes we have that feeling he really wants to know me. He's speaking to me personally. And I find that absolutely amazing. And so her life is changed because she has discovered that Jesus who died actually did it for her and he's alive so she can still share with him. So, of course, she goes and tells the guys, I've seen the Lord. She's got a job to do. She can pass it on. I said to one of you uh, today, one of you from China, oh, if you're a Christian, I, you can go and tell some of the English guys here because it will come fresh from somebody who's Chinese. You see, when you've discovered who Jesus is, just think, who are those people you know? who you could go to with Jesus and share with. And then the next paragraph tells us that he came, Jesus came to the boys whom Mary had told that she had seen the Lord. But the boys, it says at the bottom of page 57, on the evening of the first day of the week when the disciples were together, the doors were locked for fear of the Jews. And Jesus came and stood with them. And what does he say? Peace be with you. And he shows them his hands and his side. And the disciples are overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And he says, peace be with you. I'm sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. And then he tells them that they can help other people to be forgiven. You can read it there. They were frightened with good reason. Sometimes Christians suffer from people who don't like Jesus. Sometimes whole societies can be against it. So I can understand why these disciples wanted to lock the door because they were scared. But they were changed when Jesus came, wasn't it? He said, peace be with you. You can be calm now, I've won. He shows them the evidence they had seen the empty tomb, and now they saw the evidence. And not only did they see the evidence, but they met him. And they had joy and peace. And then Jesus says to them, receive the Holy Spirit. That's very important, because Jesus is actually in heaven now. And he has made this arrangement that God will come by his Holy Spirit into the hearts of all those people who trust him. That is important because I couldn't live the Christian life without God's presence. And he says to these guys, I want you to open your hearts and your personalities to receive God's Spirit so that you can do things with him and so that he can make this belief real in your hearts. He does it in all sorts of ways. But becoming a Christian is not just agreeing with the facts. It's coming to know the person. And God lets us know the person by giving us his spirit, if that's what we want. And then he says to them, you are crucial people for helping other people to be forgiven. If you do it, they'll be forgiven. If you don't, they won't. Now, isn't that interesting? You see, when you find peace with God, you need to be helping other people to find peace with God because it is really that good. The last person I want you to look at here is the guy called Thomas. And you see that on page 58, Jesus appears to Thomas. I'm just quickly going to read it because we need to have time to discuss. But I do want to read this story because it's one of my favorite ones in the Bible. It says, now Thomas called Didymus, that means he was a twin. One of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came, so the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. 
And he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side, stop doubting and believe. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. I like Thomas because he wasn't easily persuaded, was he? He was unconvinced. Do you think it was because he was a pessimist? Oh, nothing good can ever happen. Do you think it was because he was a rationalist? No, miracles don't happen, so it couldn't possibly be true. Or do you think he was just sensible, wanting to make sure? It's good to be sensible, to look at the evidence for yourself. And Thomas says, unless I see it for myself, I will not believe. One time when I was in Beijing, I, I was at the Aerospace University, and one of the students invited me into the dormitory to have a discussion with his roommates. This was in 1988, so the rooms were very crowded for students way back then. And I went into this room. I didn't know it was not allowed for foreigners to go into the dormitories, but I just went in. <laughs> and when I went in, I asked them to tell me their names. And they went around and told me their names, and one of them said, my name's Thomas. So I said, oh, do you know who Thomas was? And he said, yes, Thomas Jefferson. So I thought, oh, that wasn't what I expected. So I said, uh, do you know who Thomas Jefferson was named after? <laughs> and one of the students, I was very surprised, said, oh, yes. Jesus said to him, stick your fingers in the holes in my hand and stick your hand in my side. And I said, uh, do you believe that really happened? And he said to me, oh yes, we have lots of stories like that in China. So I said to him, uh, stories or history? And he said, oh, only stories. So I said to him, but this is history. And I began to show him some of the evidence here of the way they could look at the way the cloths that had wrapped him up had collapsed as the body had come through. At the way that people saw him when they didn't really want to believe. At the sort of evidence that Jesus gave. And after I had finished this, I said to these guys, um, so you do not need to switch off your brain to become a Christian. There is good evidence. But then I said to these guys, but you are not just brains, you are men. And as men, you need to experience the love of God. And one of them looked at me and he said to me, yes, and we need to be forgiven. I was so surprised. It just came like that, but it was so wise. And then one of them said to me, oh, but you need to recognize we've been raised on atheistic evolutionary materialism, which I thought was wonderful English for a 19-year-old who taught himself to speak English. And I said, yes, but if you're all broken inside, it's not a great thing to believe that one day there will be a super race with no problems. Christianity gives answers for real people in some of our brokenness, in the things inside us that are wrong that make a barrier between us and the one who made us. And so we see here that Jesus gives Thomas real evidence. 
it's really me, I really died, here are the signs, and I'm alive and you can see me. And what does Thomas say? Something very interesting. He says to Jesus, my Lord and my God. My Lord, that's to say, you're the boss of my life now. You're in charge. My God, that means you are the most important person in the world. You made me. You deserve everything. Help me to love you. It's an amazing story, isn't it? Some people say Jesus was only a man, but he's more than that. Some people say he's a good teacher, but only a pre teacher. But he's more than that. He deserves our love, our loyalty, our worship. The boss who made you. The boss who actually loves you. The boss you need to get forgiveness from because it would be terrible to be out of harmony with him forever. Now, how might it work? I end. I should have ended, but I'm nearly ending. How might it work? The last paragraph in this section on page 58 says, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, but they are not recorded in this book. This is only a selection. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life, you may come alive in his name. That is to say, because he had put his signature to it, you qualify, you're let in. Not because you're good enough, because none of us is, but because Jesus died in our place and he invites us to come. So I ask you, as I've asked lots of you many times already, are you talking to Jesus yet? It's a very important question. Some, of, some people I've met here say, yes, I agree, yes, I agree, yes, I agree. And I say, are you talking to Jesus yet? And they say, uh, no. I agree with these lovely truths, but I'm not actually prepared to give my life to him. That's crazy. It's like knowing there is a cure for a disease that you've got that will kill you and saying, it's okay, I feel fine at the moment, I can manage. But the sensible person will take the medicine. Just as I believe the sensible person will talk honestly to Jesus and learn to trust him, to ask him to send his spirit so that the presence of God becomes a real thing in your life and you begin to notice the differences that it makes as you live your life in company with him, okay? Last night I did something that I hadn't done earlier in the week and I'm going to do it again tonight before we finish. Well, we don't finish, we go to discussion. But some people say to me, I'd like to talk to him, but I'm not quite sure how, or I'd like to talk to him, uh, will you introduce me? I always enjoy introducing people to Jesus and to talking to him. But for a start, what I'm going to do now is quietly talk to Jesus as if I were the only person in this room, and as if I were wanting to become a Christian myself. And I'm going to do this so that if you want to, you can make those words your words and begin to learn to talk to Jesus, okay? So I'm going to pray now. Lord Jesus, thank you that you offer to give your peace to people people like me who, who need that. Thank you 
that on the cross you died not because you're bad, but because there is so much that is dirty and wrong in my life. Thank you that you did that so that I could come to know you and be in harmony with you. God, will you make that work for me, please? I'm sorry that I've lived without you. And I know that many things I have done and thought are displeasing to you. I am willing to be changed, so please forgive me and start that process of making me the person I am meant to be. Send your spirit to make it real for me and help me to live my life with you because your way is best for everyone. I ask you to do it now. Please, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you.